Welcome to our community Bible study. Uh, Profiles in Faith, it's number 13, and it is one of the series in talking about the life of Moses. This is for November the 5th, and uh, we will be talking about Moses and the Exodus. We've already talked about Moses' early life, his time confronting Pharaoh, his uh, all the plagues we talked about last week, and now we'll talk about as they begin the exodus to exit um, from the land of Egypt. You know, you can tell how important someone is to, something is to someone by the length of time they spend on it. And in a novel or a book or a reference material, you would, um, be able to see that segments that have extended time or extended pages um, are especially important. And when you look at the Bible, and especially the first uh, five books, which are called the books of Moses, the law, the Torah, um, Moses, the story of Moses, which we are taking, oh, at least four, maybe five episodes to sessions to discuss, um, reminds us of how important the story of Moses is to um, our faith and to the whole biblical story. And so even though I, as I go through this, I think, wow, haven't we finished with Moses yet? No, there's more to come. Uh, it's a good reminder of how important this is in the history of God's covenant with his people. So we're going to read from chapters 13 through 16 and talk about uh, what happens after the plagues on Egypt. Chapter 13, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. And Moses said to the people, commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. And then he goes on, and this is one of those segments that partially is written uh, looking back on the events to remind the people of what God did uh, in order to set the people free. And um, the Passover is celebration every year is a reminder of the story of what God did among his people. And part of it is you consecrate uh, the firstborn. Uh, you, during Passover, you, for seven days, you eat bread without yeast because they had to leave quickly without allowing the bread to rise. And um, uh, verse eight, on that day, in the future when you do this, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And that's a pretty good response to a kid that says, why are we doing this, eating this strange food? Why are we doing this? I wanna go play video games. I wanna go do something else. And you say, we do this because of what the Lord did to us and brought us out of Egypt. And so that is, um, that is a definition about the Passover celebration. So what happened was down in verse 14. In days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn, both of people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrificed to the Lord the first male offspring and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. Verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. That would have been to the north near the Mediterranean. 
For God said if they faced war, they might change their minds, meaning war against the Philistines. They might change their minds and return back to Egypt. So God led people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Then verse 19, remember Joseph had, had um, uh, was uh, buried in Egypt. So Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid. Then you must come carry my bones up with you from the place. Verse 20, so after leading Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So God was leading them in the direction that he wanted them to go as they left Egypt uh, to their freedom. Chapter 14, a couple more locations here. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi Hahiroth, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite baal Sephon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army and all the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Well, I think the Israelites pretty much had that figured out already, but this would be an even more dramatic scene. Five, when the king of Egypt was told the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind about them and said, what have we done? We've let them go and have lost their services, meaning all of their slave labor of but was it 600,000 men? So he had his chariot made ready and took his army. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites, and they overtook them. They caught up with them as they camped near the sea and the location that they mentioned earlier. Verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. Well, the Israelites were terrified. They cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? How's that for, for um, uh, you, a little bit of sick humor there? Were there no graves in Egypt? You had to come out here so we would die. Um, sarcasm, that's the word I was thinking of. What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we tell you, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Boy, back and forth. When things are going well, we're going with you. When things don't look so good, Moses, you got us into trouble. What in the world are you doing? Moses answered, do not be afraid. Those four words are echoed in many places throughout all of the Bible. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Not because you're gonna die, but because they are. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still, meaning don't run away. Just hang in there. God has a plan. Boy, isn't it, isn't it hard to do that, though? We get fearful. We have things that, that challenge us. And we want to just give up and do it our own way. 
sometimes God says, just be still. Chapter 15, no, verse 15. So the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? See, God gave Moses the power to do things. And Moses doesn't even remember or understand all the power he has. Mm -hmm. Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff. Remember that staff that turned into a snake and turned the river into blood and turned the sky dark and did all of these things. Stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. You know, it, it's repeating uh, the, the things that make the army so strong. If you're walking and you're being attacked by someone who's riding a chariot and people riding horses along, they have a huge advantage over you. And yet that is uh, what's happening and they will be destroyed. So the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. So that pillar of cloud also moved from the front to behind them. That was an ominous sight. <laughs> so the angel and the pillar were coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry ground. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. If you look at the study guide, I copied up uh, an artist's rendering of that. That's pretty dramatic. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord, which is nearly dawn, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army, and he threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. They had had enough. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea went back to its normal place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites continued through the sea onto dry, dry ground a wall of water on their right and on their left. On that day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord instead of questioning him and put their trust in him, even though it wasn't the day before that they didn't trust him and in Moses, his servant. So it was evident of God's mighty hand against the Egyptians, which was, of course, um, uh, you know, taught the Egyptians about the Lord and also was an example to probably other nations around the region. Now, chapter 15 is about the song and I'm missing a page here. Oh, there it is. And if we remember back to 
how you teach young people and adults as well to remember things, to remember the stories. One of the ways we see repeated in, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, is often there is a song that recaps the story. And it's part of, um, you, this might even be the oldest part of the scripture because that song was probably used over and over and that is retells the story. I confess that although I know my alphabet, all 26 letters, I cannot recite the ABCs without hearing that tune in my brain that I was taught, A, B, C, D, you know, <laughs> those things. We remember tunes. I recently saw a little program and they were going over um, jingles that were used in commercials on TV in the 70s. I recognize every single one of them. Um, it is words and music together. Teachers in schools use music to repeat things over, and, or even you learn something in a little sing-song fashion. It uses different parts of your brain together. And so here is basically the story we just told, but is um, this little song. Now, I learned a tune a while back that repeats part of this, and I'll just sing a tiny bit of it for you. And that's it. But I will sing unto the Lord, for he is triumph gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. The Lord, my strength. Um, anyway, that's how it goes. That was something I learned as a camp song when I was working with younger people at our church a few years back. Anyway, that is the basic part of 15. We're not going to read through it. But you ought to do that sometimes because it's the, it's the song that tells the story. We're going to skip to verse 19. And um, Pharaoh's horses, chariots, horsemen all went out into the sea. The Israelites came through on dry ground. Then, you know, Moses had his song. Now here Miriam, the prophet, who was Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed and danced and sang, Sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted. The horse and the driver he's thrown into the sea. So Miriam had her, had her song for the ladies as well. Verse 22. Now Moses is out there. God has shown him the way. So Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. They go into the desert of Shur. Now desert is going to be a challenge because most of these people, although they lived in desert lands in Egypt, always had the Nile and always had the resources of their nation. So here though, for three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. This is a lot of people. What well, is was it 600,000 men plus women and children and some animals. Um, uh, they needed water. When it came to Mara, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. So the people grumbled again against Moses. What are we to drink? Moses again calls out to the Lord. The Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it in the water, and the water was then fit to drink. The Lord issued a ruling and instruction and said, pay attention. I will not bring on you any diseases for the, from the Egyptians. Uh, I am the Lord who heals you. And then in verse 7, 27, they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. There was plenty for everyone. Well, chapter 16. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam. They came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. In the desert, the whole community grumbles again against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. 
There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you brought us out to the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. What are they going to do? Well, God had a plan. The Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Now, I don't know about the first time he heard that. I'm sure he's thinking, what? Bread is going to fall out of heaven? The people are to go out each day and gather enough for the day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. So each day they go out and gather enough just for the day. They have to trust. That's enough. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that's twice as much as they gather on the other days, so they don't have to gather on the seventh. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, In the evening you will know it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you'll see the glory of the Lord, because he's heard your grumbling. You will know it was the Lord when he gives you meat in the evening and the bread you want in the morning because he heard your grumbling. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but the Lord. So then uh, that continues and it, it sort of repeats this story a little bit. So verse 13, that evening quail came and covered the camp. That was good meat. In the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. The Israelites asked, what is it? They didn't know what it was. Moses said, it's the bread the Lord gave you to eat. This is what the Lord commanded. Remember, gather as much as you need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. Now, I looked it up, and omer was probably about the size of a cup today, uh, just a slightly less than a cup, people have figured out. So they would take that amount for each person, and then they had to trust that that also would be repeated the next day. Well, the Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some gathered little. When they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much didn't have too much, and the one that gathered little didn't have a little. They had just what they needed. They, they got what they needed for the day. Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it till the morning. However, a few of them didn't pay any attention. They kept part of it till morning, and then it was full of maggots and began to smell. Mm. So Moses was angry. It was pretty clear who didn't follow the directions. By morning, each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed. And when the sun grew hot, that manna um, was melted away. And on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much. And this is what the Lord commanded. So the seventh day could be a day of Sabbath rest. We're going to skip down to verse 27. Nevertheless, some people went out on the seventh day to gather it, and they didn't find any. So they had to follow these, these directions. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and instructions? Remember the Sabbath. That's why on the sixth day we give you enough for two days. So boy, there's this struggle back and forth of learning to trust God and following his commands, even when you think you got a better idea or when you're not sure. And if, if you think about people had been slaves and they, they did have a rough life as slaves, but they didn't know the survival skills they needed in the desert. But one of those survival skills was to trust the Lord and not to trust in the Pharaoh and the Egyptian system that they lived under. So verse 31, the people of Israel called the bread that they got every morning manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey, nice and sweet. Moses said, this is what the Lord commands. Take an omer of manna and keep it for generations to come. So they can see the bread I gave to eat 
gave you to eat in the wilderness. So Moses told Aaron, take a jar, put an omer of man in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept for generations to come. So as the Lord commanded, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law, which by the way, they haven't received yet, but that's gonna come down the road. So it can be preserved. So in the Ark of the Covenant, um, the Ark that carries the covenant law, um, they also had a little jar of manna. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years. So if you get tired of your, your meals being repeated here at Village on the Green, remember that you could be eating manna for 40 years until they came to a land that was settled and they ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. So that is them going in, exiting and learning to survive in the desert. We will have one more week next week about Moses and it's about the giving of the law. And we can't miss, we can't leave that out. So um, remember that God is trying to teach us to trust him. And uh, every time we think that we're stubborn or we're failing in trusting God, think about the people of Israel. God continues to work with them. He will continue to work with us. God bless you. Bye-bye.